morning and welcome to Gazzetta Football Italia. Well, we're up north this week in the city of Milan, home of a once great footballing empire that's busy crumbling all over the place. Later on in the show, we'll be picking through the ruins with the likes of Dennis Bergkamp. That to look forward to, plus loads of other stuff besides. And indeed, here is Kenneth Wilson home with a full rundown on today's programme. Coming up, a weekend's action that had plenty of surprises in store, including the season's strangest celebration. James Richardson runs the rule over the press reaction. And visits Milan, a footballing city in a state of shock. England captain David Platt previews tomorrow's live clash with the reigning champions. And we check on the progress of both Milan and Sampdoria, who along with Italy's four other survivors were all in European action this week. Good, right, well then, time to look back at last weekend in Syria, and what an amazing weekend it was. Shock results from all over Syria coming in and leaving the papers on Monday morning in a rather shocked state. Here was the Gazzetta della Sport, topsy-turvy Italy, they say. The Corriere della Sera, uh, football goes upside down, and the Repubblica, the topsy-turvy championship. Certainly the most bizarre afternoon of action since uh, that Gary Bloom business, really, at the Christmas Christmas party. The mighty falling in droves all over the country. And first up, let's see Roberto Baggio and the noble Juventus coming a cropper down Foggia Way. Here is Gary Bloom. Juventus haven't won a league game in Foggia in 18 seasons. They defeated Foggia in an away game three years ago. That match was played in Bari. They have a corner kick now, though, to be taken by Roberto Baggio. Swing in towards Marocchi. And the marking there for Foggia was slack, to say the least. Marocchi stole in and almost stole a goal. Ventus one of three Serie A clubs still unbeaten this season. A forced play in this first half, but not too much to show for it. De Biagio with the interception. Biagioni now. De Biagio to his left. Oh, he's pulled it wide. And Foggia miss out on a real opportunity to take the lead. This so typical of so many goals Foggia have scored over the last couple of years they're so quick to break from these sort of positions when they win the ball and De Biagio really might have found the target there Genie with the long clearance Ola cushions his head up De Vincenzo Plenty of width to this Foggia attack now. Bresciani's waiting in the middle, and he scored! Or has the ball crossed the line? The referee says goal to Foggia. Peruzzi will blame himself that he allowed the ball to pass through his legs. But the Juventus team aren't convinced that the ball crossed the goal line. This was a rather inept piece of goalkeeping, but did the Juventus goalkeeper recover in time? So Marcello Lippi's side still a goal behind, as Baggio takes the corner kick. Conte hooks it back in, hopefully. Conte again, oh! It was only a foot or so away. It promises to be a frustrating afternoon for the away side. De Vincenzo. Bresciani. He's past Giro Ferrara. He's clean through on goal. And it's 2-0! Bresciani scores again. He's buried under a mountain of players who all know now Foggia have beaten Juventus and that hasn't happened too many times in recent years. 
Again, the goal is spiked with controversy because Juventus feel there was a free kick there as Bresciani pushed Ferrara away from the ball and then hammered it home. Bresciani's through again. Yanni has given away a penalty kick. Watch the left arm of Robert Yanni. It brought down Bresciani. Biagioni yeah, scored six out of six penalties for Foggia, but that's a very, very weak one. The short run up almost showed contempt for Peruzzi. And the scoreline remains Foggia 2, Juventus 0. della Juventus dopo sei giornate di campionato probabilmente non se l'aspettava nessuno forse neanche lei no sicuramente no però visto come ci stiamo comportando insomma credo che questi risultati insomma queste prestazioni credo che ci possiamo anche dire di essere meritati oggi è andato tutto bene perché la squadra ha lavorato direi come sa ha pressato è stata molto corta ha rischiato pochissimo e trovato il gol abbiamo trovato anche degli spazi importanti che, dove abbiamo fondato direi con Bresciani in modo molto in modo notevole insomma ecco, abbiamo costruito la vittoria direi in quegli spazi che la Juventus è stato gioco forza ha dovuto concedersi so some doubts over Foggia's first goal there but none whatsoever about the result as indeed Tutorsport put it on Monday morning phantom goal but phantom Juve 2 uh, also worth noting the Corriere della Sport Foggia is the end of the line for oh, Corriere della Sera I did them a disservice Foggia is the end of the line for Juve's alibis and the Gazzetta della Sport Foggia leaves Juve naked. I must have missed that bit in the highlights. Anyway, something of a shocker, I think it's fair to say, at Foggia, and there was more to come too as Bari travelled up to the San Siro to face Inter. You somehow felt week six would provide a series of shock results from the moment Guerrero gave Bari the lead at Inter in the very first minute. Inter had failed to score in three of their previous five league games and wouldn't have been too pleased with the form of Fontana in Bari's goal. First Orlando and then Dennis Bergkamp were kept out. Indeed, the Dutchman was denied on two occasions. Having already scored his first goal since his arrival in Italy, Miguel Guerrero almost doubled his tally for the season. Bari doubled their tally in this game four minutes before half-time through Sandro Tavolieri, last season's leading scorer and still the leading link in Bari's chain. Perhaps Bari were fortunate they didn't concede a penalty in the second half after Panchev appeared to be hauled down. The Colombian Guerrero was unfortunate not to score his second goal of the game. With 15 minutes remaining, Panchev gave Inter hope of a late comeback with his second goal of the season. Bari appealed for offside, although Panchev seemed to be level with Bari's last defender when Yonk delivered the pass. The goal stood, but Bari held on to win at the San Siro for the first time. Materazzi, un successo storico in ogni senso. No, un senso storico perché arriva dopo tantissimi anni che il Bari non riusciva a vincere qui a Meazza. Praticamente mai. Inter, ma praticamente mai, tanti anni, praticamente mai. E dopo la vittoria in Coppa Italia da parte dell'Inter sul Milan, eh, per cui questo va da valorare maggiormente il nostro risultato, la nostra vittoria, che secondo me non fa una piega, anzi poteva essere un attimino più limpida, al di là del 2-1 per quelle che due squadre hanno espresso in campo. Well, what a historic result there. Corriere dello Sport on Monday. Bari have a great time humiliating Inter. And then underneath, Bianchi is furious. We should all be fired. A similar theme from him in most newspapers this week. Uh, in particular, Tudor Sport, Pellegrini, fire us all, he says, starting with me, Ottavio Bianchi, the arty fufkin, really, of Milanese football. Anyway, further disasters then for Inter. But what of their crosstown rivals, Milan, the Italian and European champions after all? Surely they wouldn't have any difficulty against bottom of the table Padova. You'd have put your last Italian ice cream on Milan, winning its struggling Padova in white, but you'd have been left with just an empty corner had you done so. Midway through the first half, the unthinkable happened. Padova, who only secured their first Serie A point of the season two weeks ago against Napoli, took the lead through their USA international Alexi Lalas. 
There was a suspicion of offside about the goal, but that didn't diminish Lannis' raucous celebrations after the goal. Fabio Capello, the Milan coach, wanted to discuss the decision with the linesman. Milan's fortunes took another nosedive when Frenchman Marcel Desailly was sent off for his second bookable offence. The fairy tale result was all the more remarkable because Padova were without two suspended players. The goalkeeper, Bonayuti, was having quite a game too. Still, Padova needed a giant helping of luck to remain a goal in front. This was Albertini almost forcing an equaliser. But an hour into the match, a second Padova defender registered his name on the score sheet. This was Gabrielli's first Serie A goal. Padova two up against the champions, and every public address announcer in Italian football couldn't wait to spill the beans. There was still time for Rude Hullet to shake the Padova goal, but not their resolve. And Padova's poorest defence, which had leaked 15 goals in the opening five games, had their best day of the season so far. Don't tell the Prime Minister, Silvio Berlusconi, that Milan have now lost five times in all competitions this season. Credo che quest'oggi non meritavamo di perdere qui a Padova, siamo stati penalizzati dall'espulsione di Dejai, altre volte nella stessa situazione avevamo recuperato, quest'oggi invece abbiamo colpito solo dei pali e abbiamo avuto delle occasioni da per segnare, non le abbiamo sottate, evidentemente che è un momento non favorevole e siamo stati castigati nel secondo gol che probabilmente ha tagliato un po' le gambe alla squadra eh, con un tiro straordinario ma di un giocatore che con quel piede non si ritengono sappia fare molto bravo però so tales of the unexpected all round last weekend in Syria the first time in 28 years that Milan Inter and Juve have all lost on the same day or so the papers tell me reaction to that Milan defeat uh, as follows to the sport Milan you finished offside a neat little pun there uh, Gazzetta della Sport, Padova announces it's no longer Milan, Lala sings the end of an era, one from his back catalogue I think there, and uh, Corriere della Sport, Lala plays Milan dances. Lala obviously after the game was overjoyed, I can't believe we're discussing me actually scoring a goal against Milan, he told a crowd of reporters who were just coming round themselves. Well done to him though and to Gabrielli, what on earth has happened to the champions? They haven't won an away game yet this season and it's not just in the league that they have problems. In the Coppa Italia last week they lost the derby with Inter and then last Friday came UEFA's decision finally on that goalkeeper hit by a bottle incident in the Champions League. The verdict was much worse than the papers expected, Milan getting a two-game ban from the San Siro and losing the two points from that win, although bizarrely they keep the three goals they scored against Salzburg. Salzburg, meanwhile, whose goalkeeper was actually hit, received nothing at all. Well, neither club, of course, happy with the decision and the papers don't think much of it either. Here's the Gazetta from last Saturday, uh, appropriately enough. A bottle on the head from UEFA, they call it. Milan revolt, uh, they're appealing against the decision. Corriere della Sport the same day, UEFA burn the devil. Not the first time, of course, that uh, Milan have been in trouble with the European authorities. They were banned from European competition for a year back in 1991 after walking off during that game with Marseille. This time, the punishment means that they're back down the bottom of their group in the Champions League and face a somewhat uphill struggle to qualify for the next round. So, problems then for Milan, and with Milanese football in general in a state of decline right now, the new capital of the Italian game has to be Rome. Rome are at the top of the table all alone for the first time in a 11 years, hearty congratulations to them, and they've got their beloved cousins Lazio steaming up behind them too, especially after that 5-1 win over Napoli on Sunday. An extraordinary result this, all five Lazio goals coming in the first half, and one of them even from Gigi Casuragi. Bizarre, either he's on something these days or we are. Anyway, after that humiliation at the hands of Lazio, as you can imagine, there have been further eruptions this week down in Naples. Two weeks ago, you'll probably recall, from Napoli fired their coach Guarini for the day, and now after telling him to stop expecting the worst all the time, they got rid of him for good. His replacement, none other than the decidedly optimistic Serb of Vujadim Boskov. The paper's reaction, here's the Corriere dello Sport, Boskov to Napoli, and the Gazetta to uh, Boskov to Napoli. I think we get the picture there. Uh, Boskov going indeed to Napoli. He was last seen in Syria at the helm of AS Roma a year ago. Before that, though, he won the Scudetto with Sampdoria and, of course, a championship title with Real Madrid, naturally enough, in Spain. At Napoli, though, he inherits a team that in the last two years has sold off the cream of its players, including Daniel Fonseca and Gianfranco Zola, a fact which goes a long way to explain their recent poor performances. Napoli did manage a good result, ironically enough, this Tuesday in Europe, but they'd already decided to fire their coach Guarini by that point, although since no one had actually let him know, he was still on the bench as normal. 
The poor chap didn't actually find out about his dismissal, which was decided days before, until post-game when his wife rang up after seeing the TV news. Indeed, as the Corriere commented on Thursday morning, Guarini, the first man fired by TV. Napoli certainly pioneering some modern techniques in management there, but you have to agree with Guarini when he says they should be ashamed of themselves. Anyway, another coach bites the dust in Serie A. Who will be next for the chop? Well, the papers reckon it'll be none other than Marchioro of Reggiana, a team so disastrous right now that they're probably lining up George Kennedy as the replacement. Well, we'll see what happens about that in next week's Gazetta. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we'll uh, conclude our look at the newspapers there. Coming up after the break, we'll have goals, goals, goals from Serie A, European Cup highlights too, plus a chat with David Platt. All of that in a minute or two, so join us then. The new Compact Presario is a home computer that has everything you need to run your own business, including a built-in answer phone and fax. It also comes with CD-ROM to bring interactive learning to your children and multimedia entertainment to you. The new Presario from Compact. Delta fly over 220 planes from Europe to America. And that calls for a little synchronized flying. Delta Airlines. We love the way we fly. And now, bottle the director's cut. Viewers may find certain scenes strong, yet light. Just imagine their greatest ever sign. Greg throws it out to Giggs, and Giggs the ball inside to Crayer and a header back to Styles. Styles forward to Johnny Carey. Now to Charlton. Oh, a long one. Way out to Giggs. A beautiful pass. Giggs now with that lovely footwork into Violet. Violet now switching the play over towards this right wing. And he finds Koppel. Koppel. He's got Charlie Mitten in front of him. And he finds Mitten with that lovely side foot pass. Now Dennis Law beats one. He beats two. Now oh, here's Best to Giggs. And Best locks it down. He shoots and it's always oh, hit the bar. Charlton now. Giggs. Giggs trying to find space. And now he's found it. Oh, what a beautiful goal! Their yeah, greatest ever side. Giggs would be in it. And he'd be in rebound boots. Welcome back to Gazetta Football Italia. In a minute or two, seaside fun with David Platt as he tells us some more tales of Sampdoria. Also coming up, there'll be European Cup highlights from midweek. But right now, we start with more top-of-the-table action from last weekend in Serie A and Lazio against Napoli. The most eventful first half took place in the Olympic Stadium. Alan Boxic nodding in the first of six goals in the opening 45 minutes. Napoli, without a league win since the opening day of the season, have been unrecognisable in recent weeks, and their new away kit made them even more so. Rambaudi almost added a second for Lazio there. The pressure is on Napoli's coach, Vincenzo Guarini. Still, there's little he can do when his highly rated forwards forget the art of kicking the ball. 
Aaron Vinter had no such trouble at the other end. He gave Lazio a two-goal lead on 20 minutes. The Dutch international then produced a rare error. Massimo Agostini, nicknamed the Condor, might have been given a new nickname by the end of the game. Just after the half-hour mark, Napoli did manage a goal. Freddie Rincon finally provided the sort of form he's capable of, and Pecchia provided the finish. Lazio restored their two-goal cushion three minutes later through Cassi Raghi. This is his fourth goal in three games in all competitions. Another two minutes passed and another goal was scored, this time by Negro. Kesi Raghi had struck the upright. Lazio made it 5-1 before the half-time whistle. Arden Vinter with his second of the game. And Napoli had conceded their 11th goal in their last three Serie A games. It could have been worse for Napoli, but somehow they stopped Lazio from adding to their advantage in the second half. Time after time, Lazio exposed their vulnerability in defence. Casiraghi should have scored there. Perhaps had Beppe Signori been playing, Napoli may have suffered their worst ever defeat in Serie A. His number 11 jersey was worn by Casiraghi with distinction. The same can't be said of Napoli's garish away kit. Regina in red went into this match off the back of five straight league defeats. At the bottom of the table, and I suppose they're the Everton of Serie A at the moment. But De Napoli threatened to give them the lead. Robbiati's free kick had the Regina fans feeling, here we go again, until Antonioli's excellent save. Regina took the lead those six minutes from half-time with a well-worked goal scored by Giorgio Bresciani. And pumped up with confidence following his goal, Bresciani almost won the game shortly afterwards. Fiorentina's passport back into this match was a woeful tackle by Gambaro, who'd only just completed a transfer from Fiorentina to Reggiana. But his old pals weren't complaining, and Gabriel Battistuta kept up his goal a game average from the penalty spot. Coming up, the save of the match, courtesy of Toldo to deny Bresciani a winning goal. And there was still time for a red card late in the game for Cherubini for this tackle from behind. But at least Reggiana secured their first point of the new season. That's brilliant now. On for Brolin. Three up in this attack. Zola sprinting forward. Zola's pass. And there's no flag. Zola! And Palma takes the lead. Sampdoria defenders looking in vain for an offside flag. What a fantastic bit of football, Peter, wasn't it? Aspria starts it off in, in uh, his own half. A great ball for Brolin. Brolin breaks very, very quickly, and we've not seen him do that in this game. Uh, really did show a lot of pace through the middle of the field. Good ball to Zola. And if we can see it again, Zola's heads up all the time. He knows where everybody is. He gives it out there to Kripa. Kripa, tremendous composure, rolls it back across the box. I think he, Zola even gives Ferry the eyes there, looking in one corner and puts it in the other. Really first-class goal. Mancini. It's a useful ball in as well, and it's just got wide. Melly. There is Via Cavalt. Mihailovic. Lombardo, it's a penalty! Fernando Couto has been penalised for the tackle then on Lombardo. Yeah, it's a good ball into Lombardo, he lets it run, he just rolls Couto, he gets a little bit too tight to him and he rolls him and uh, he doesn't take too much for players to go. Well, I personally don't think it is a penalty, but... I'm not sure he's even touched him. But it's Maspero, the second half substitute. He has been given the responsibility now of beating Luca Bucci. And he does so in style.
Mancini! Is that another penalty? I wonder if young Maspero will take this one. It's uh, it's always very interesting. I think it was just outside, actually, Peter, when the contact finished. The first him. contact, yeah. yeah. It was just outside. Oh! It squirmed in. Oh, Butchie was so unlucky there. Manini. This is Mancini. Well, there's no substitute for class, Peter, is there? We've had a bit of a pop in him this afternoon. He really hasn't uh, performed to his the sort of standards we know Mancini, but there is no substitute for class. And the way he beat Bucci there was just fantastic. A lovely little through ball through to him, and there he is. He's half turned already, knows exactly where he is, knows exactly where Bucci is. And look at that. Absolutely beautiful. That's his 100th goal. goal Fantastic for Yeah, remarkable stuff. There you see, he's already half-turned. He knows where exactly where everybody is. And a little dink over the goalkeeper as he comes out. Great goal. Fantastic. Well, here we are by the seaside with David Plass of St. Dorian. And a good result there for your boys, without which I think you would have been quite literally on the rocks. Yeah, that's right. I think um, it was so important for us to win the game yesterday, especially after coming on the back of two defeats against Juventus and Roma. Um, with it being three points for a one, what it's done, especially with the, the top teams losing, it's put us back into contention and hopefully tomorrow against Milan we can get some more points and keep keep up there because it's going to be a long season. You're four points off the lead now. Ahead of you there's Parma, Roma, Foggia and Lazio. Uh, who do you see of this group as uh, potential winners this year? Well, certainly the two Roman teams there, Roma and Lazio, are doing very, very well. Um, Roma keep putting points onto it, and with Balbo and Fonseca up front there, then they're always going to score goals. And it looks as though they've strengthened the, the whole team, and they're not conceding a great deal either. Mm. Lazio are scoring goals left, right and centre, and if they can continue to, to do things like that, especially with people like Paul out as well, um, when he comes back in the new year, I'm sure that that will give them a, a new lift, and if they can stay in contention, then they've got a good chance as well. So if you had to risk a bit of money on a, on a title contender right now, David, who would you slap it on? Um, I think Palmer have got the pedigree to stay there right until the finish. I think the, the other teams might get some strange results, um, whereas I think Palmer are more complete. Um, I thought that you can still rule out Milan. Right. Um, people are saying they're playing really, really badly, and yet they're in the same position as ourselves. If they can, once they get all their players back fit, and because after the World Cup, obviously they sent a great deal of players mm. to the World Cup, and they're not at the fittest just yet. Um, once they're all back, um, and Milan are firing on, on all cylinders, then I expect them to put a lot of results together. And with it being three points for a win, you can soon um, amass a certain amount of points. Indeed. Well, what about you then? Um, you're still here in Sam, despite all the rumours to the country, <laughs> and uh, enjoying the fine weather. What yeah, that's right. Um, obviously, there's been rumours and they've come about really because of the fact that you know my contract up is, is up at the end of this season. But I've said before that uh, I'm very, very happy here and if, uh, even when we sit down and we talk about a new contract, then I think I'm going to be delighted to sign it. Mm. Um, it's still early doors and we've got to wait and see and you can never rule out the possibility of me going home. Mm. But I would, say, I would say if I had to make a decision now, then the decision would be to stay here. So the possibility we'll be seeing you against Milan tomorrow. Uh, the champions in something of a state right now. Yeah, that's right. They've not been going very well, except, uh, apart from the fact that they've got 10 points and they're still in there. Um, but they haven't been scoring goals and they were beaten last week against Padova, yeah. um, which nobody would have predicted. Uh, Especially the Lallas goal. That's right, yeah. I mean, he, that's the new rule that's come into play, that if somebody's in a, a passive mm. offside position, then he, he's not ruled out as offside. Um, and really, that, that, that's given them the first goal because Lallas has scored it from an offside position, but the ball wasn't played to him. And, you know, the, the Milan people have been grumbling this week, but the rules are the rules, mm. um, and the referees have got to follow them. Um, we've got this game tomorrow, of course, we, it would be nice to go to the San Siro and take three points. Having said that, I'm sure that if we come back with, with a point, then we'll all be happy. OK, and the house? You moved into a new house? That's right, in the same complex that you, uh, you all saw last year. Yeah. Um, but we, we've moved nearer to the sea and away from the trains. Um, it's all on one level. It was the the house that Katanech had last year. Right. Um, we're just getting that right now. So what sort of area is this? I mean, we're at the south of Genoa, and this is a fairly plush area. The sea's clean, which 
means there must be rich people. Yeah, that's right. I think we're, we're probably about 20 minutes outside the city. Um, and it's more the little fishing villages like this one here. This is Boliasco. I live at the next one down, um, Pierre Villigri. And they're all little fishing villages. I think the, you know, the locals go out and fish at night and then come in, in early mornings and sell the fish that they've caught to the restaurants. Mm. It's very, very laid back and very relaxed. Mm. So a good lifestyle. Magnificent. See you soon. See you. Bye. But Sam's fans didn't see David Platt in Cup Winners' Cup action in midweek. Sampdoria were also without Mancini and Jugovic, but they earned an impressive 3-0 win against Grasshopper of Zurich. Alessandro Melli gave the Genoa club the lead on the stroke of half-time. A missile from Mihailovic made it 2-0 to the home side on 76 minutes and shortly afterwards Attilio Lombardo set up Ricardo Maspero who crowned a splendid display with goal number three. In the UEFA Cup, Napoli once again had Benito Carbone to thank for keeping their season alive. Carbone's third goal in the competition levelled the tie an hour in. This after Boavista had taken a first half lead through Sanchez. But while Napoli's coach Vincenzo Guerini toasted his team's commendable draw in Oporto, incredibly he was informed of his dismissal after the game. Guerini's successor is the former boss of both Sampdoria and Roma, Buyadin Boskov, who returns to the big stage following a year's absence. Just as they did in the first round against Dynamo Minsk, Lazio earned a golden straw in their away leg, this time in Trelleborg. Remember the Swedes eliminated Blackburn last month? It was a bitterly disappointing game. Neither side was able to create noteworthy goal-scoring opportunities. Signori's effort was as close as Lazio came to finding the net all evening. Following their disappointing defeat in Foggia two days earlier, Juventus will have welcomed their excursion to the Portuguese holiday island of Madeira to play Maritimo. Even Gianluca Viale was in good spirits, despite the fact that he was dropped from Juve's starting lineup. Juventus fielded Ravanelli, Del Piero, and Roberto Baggio up front in Funchal. But it was the Portuguese number 10 who came the closest to opening the scoring early in the second half. Only the crossbar denied Vardo an invaluable goal. The 25-year-old midfielder took full advantage of the space in Juve's defence, who would again without Jürgen Kohler. The German international is currently serving a four-match ban in Europe. Juventus were then put under pressure from a corner, although Maritimo's captain, Carlos George, failed to steer his header on target. But it was Juventus who claimed the only goal of the game after 78 minutes. Roberto Baggio delightfully set up Fabrizio Ravanelli, who kept up his remarkable record in the competition by scoring his sixth goal. Remember, Ravanelli created history for an Italian player when he struck five times against CSKA Sofia in the Turin club's last UEFA Cup match. Roberto Baggio was the key to the goal, but Ravanelli was there again in the right place at the right time. Juventus 1-0 winners on the night. Like Juventus, Parma left it late in their UEFA Cup match. They secured a 1-0 victory 17 minutes from full time. Faustino Aspilio was the architect of the move, which led to the winning goal. Massimo Creeper was the scorer. In Greece, Milan faced a crucial Champions League fixture against AEK Athens. Your commentator, Gary Bloom. Oh, there's a clash of heads there with Maldini, and Kopsis almost scores. Sadovakos now. And in the end, it's an easy catch for Rossi, but there's great concern about the Milan defender, Maldini. Blood is streaming from a head wound, and Milan not only lost a defender, they almost lost a goal here. AEK have drawn one and lost one of their Champions League games so far. Kasapis now links up with... Savesky. Sartas and tries a shot and Rossi has to go full length to save it. Sadavakos then tries to beat Rossi on the near post. Oh, this one's given away to Masado. Pull it's in space here. 
and he should have at least forced the goalkeeper into a save. Desai. Then here is Albertini. Aimed in towards Hullet on the back post, Donadoni! Nobody picked out Donadoni's run as he cut in from the right wing. Hullet, picking out Masado now. Trying to get away from Manolas, this is Hullet. And Masaro will retrieve the ball on the right wing. Donadoni! That easily Milan's best chance of the game so far. Splendidly drifted in here by Masaro. And why didn't Donadoni stay on his feet? That miss from Donadoni could prove costly for Milan. A look at the Group D table shows that the reigning champions are in real danger of going out before the knockout stage. We'll have more European action in a fortnight's time. And that's it for part two. After the break, more Serie A action, plus a trip to Milan, a soccer city in crisis. If you're six foot, as I am, next time you're flying business class, try this simple test. If your toes touch the seat in front, you're on the wrong plane. Gripping the Daily Echo. A thrilling account of a community. Oswald Boone. A fast-paced, action-packed expose of modern society. Naomi Woodcock. A triumph, cunningly constructed and closely observed. Gerald Freep. The essential guide to your area. Bulgarian Cabernet Sauvignon? Bulgarian? Mm, excellent! But, 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 tell me... Not more? <sighs> Bulgarian wine, fantastic! My photography is about life, even when I photograph death. I do all of this because it's about believing my pictures are the truth. If you're documenting life, a moment only happens once. Everything's a one-shot deal. You get it or you don't. What makes me laugh is, you know, getting through the tiniest keyhole and getting it all when they say it's impossible. Photographs are only as good as the position you get in. I can't get a photograph if I'm not in position. This car gets me into that position. How are you, sir? Hi, nice I'm, to uh, see you. I'm looking for a yes, new car. New car. Like no my car, old car, but with a little more room. room. Yes, more yeah. economy. Uh -huh. Lower emissions. No problem. Right. He wants a new car, like his old car, only better. Better. Do, do you work out? Huh? Texaco's new Clean System 3 is designed to clean more thoroughly than ever before. It gets to work from the first tank full. Like your old car, but better. Hey, what are you trying to pull? Just take her for a test drive. Use it regularly, and given time, you could feel you're in a different car. I'll take it. In avocado. New Clean System 3 from Texaco. Test drive it today. Well, Saturday night at 8 o'clock. I know where I'm gonna go I'm gonna pick my baby up And take her to the picture show Saturday night and the moon 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 Welcome back. James Richardson's special report from Milan still to come, but first, the rest of last weekend's action from Serie A, starting at struggling Brescia.
Genoa went into this game at Brescia following a midweek defeat at High Flyers Roma in the Italian Cup. Seven minutes in, Scoravi took advantage of Balotta's aberration to give Genoa the lead. However, you must feel some sympathy for the Brescia goalkeeper. I'm sure he'll be blaming the pitch for the Czech's third goal of the season. One man who has been in form for Genoa this campaign is Marco Nappi. His direct style and quick feet gave rise to the sending off of Brescia's young defender Mezzanotti early in the second half. Marco Nappi turned the Brescia defence inside out, sadly for him, he failed to get his name on the score sheet last weekend. Well, strangely enough, Brescia was still in this game and in fact found an equaliser 11 minutes from full-time through Gallo. It was his first in Serie A. Suddenly, Genoa were on the back foot, but could rely on Tacconi to stop the home side from scoring again. Sabau had the shot. Then in injury time, Genoa secured all three points with a deserved winner scored by Deli Carey. Cavalry had collected four points from a possible six at home before this game. Daly Valdez and Luis Oliveira were always going to cause Cremonese problems in defence. Delinia's second caution for a foul on Oliveira resulted in a red card. Here Herrera's free kick produced the illusion of a goal for the home fans. They didn't have to wait too long for Cavalry to open the scoring. Inevitably, it was Daly Valdez and Oliveira who combined. Oliveira struck shortly before half-time. There were no more goals after the interval, there were chances for both teams. Canary have still to concede a league goal at home this season. The best opportunity in the second half fell to Luis Oliveira. First, he only had the goalkeeper to beat. Eventually, he had practically the entire Cremonese defence to contend with. Daly Valdez was also denied a goal. Still, Cremonese went down to their third successive away defeat in Serie A. Joint league leaders Roma in white scored an early goal away to Torino. This was the live Sunday night game on Italian television. It's no surprise to find Abel Balbo on the score sheet. This was his sixth goal in four games, and it gave Roma the lead eight minutes in. This was probably one of the better games of the weekend. It was probably one of the better saves of the weekend too. Chivoni keeping out Pelli's header. Roma looked nervous in defence and were lucky to survive a penalty appeal here as Benedetti appeared to hold back Silenzi. Rizzitelli, who was signed from Roma in the summer, then contrived to miss against his old club. Fonseca could have given Roma an unassailable lead before half-time. Albiero's cross was very inviting. Roma soon lost central defender Marco Lana through injury and they soon lost their lead too as Rizzitelli was more than a little pleased to score against a club which had sold him. More goals like this in the capital, and he'd still probably be a Roma player. Curious penalty decision of the week coming up. Apparently, Capioli was being held back here. If you can shed some light on how the referee came to this decision, let us know. Fonseca scored his third goal of the season to restore Roma's lead. Torino had their own penalty appeals turned down shortly afterwards and then contrived to miss this chance through Shenza. Twelve minutes from full-time, Roma's neurotic cautioning defence was undone with the equalising goal scored by Cristellini. This was the first Serie A goal he'd scored after joining the club from Pisa in the summer. Roma will need to defend better than this if they're going to mount a successful title challenge in the coming months. It ended 2-2. Roma dropping their first points since the opening day there, but the draw was enough to take them clear at the top, the latest step in a remarkable return to form after the disappointments of the past two campaigns. Indeed, with Roma top, Foggia fourth, and Bari, many experts tip for relegation this season, lying one place above Milan, there's a distinctly unfamiliar look about the top half. Few surprises at the bottom, although Inter, Torino and most notably Napoli will be looking to make up on some of the lost ground this weekend. In the scoring charts, Gabriel Batistuta still leads the way, although his Argentinian teammate, Abel Balbo, is in hot pursuit. 
He'll be aiming to get on target again this weekend as Roma's title challenge continues against Cagliari, a fixture you can see in Mezzanotte next Tuesday night. Currently, Roma's pursuit of their first title since 1983 is based around a remarkable understanding already built up between Balbo and his new South American striking partner, Uruguay's Daniel Fonseca. Nine goals between them so far, and the promise of plenty more to come. But while the Cagliari defence won't be looking forward to meeting that pair, the Roma defence won't be feeling too confident either, as they prepare to face a forward line every bit as daunting as Balbo and Fonseca. The Brazilian-born Belgian international, Luis Oliveira, has already tormented some of the best defences in Serie A, while his partner up front, the giant Panamanian Julio Dele Valdez, is more than a handful for anyone. Either man is capable of damaging Roma's title prospects. And as we've already seen, this does look like a season for shocks. It promises to be a battle royal between two sets of super strikers, so don't miss extended highlights of that match in Mezzanotte on Tuesday night. Among the other big games, it's a crunch weekend for the two Milan giants. Inter face another potential disaster at Inform Foggia, while Milan play host to Sampdoria, a game you can see live tomorrow afternoon. As the city of Milan braces itself for yet more disappointments, James Richardson has been up north to get the inside story on a soccer-mad city still reeling from the shocks of recent weeks. Just this summer, Milanese football was riding high. Milan indeed becoming in May the first city ever to have two teams winning two different European Cup competitions simultaneously. First Inter with the UEFA Cup, and then a week later, Milan with the Champions Cup. A 4-0 victory over fancied Barcelona, reasserting Italian dominance of the game and confirming Milan as a soccer stronghold. Five months on, though, from all those excitements, things have certainly changed here in Milan. Milan and Inter are now in deep trouble, and with both teams' problems characterised by disastrous defeats on Sunday, it's time to ask what on earth has happened to the capital of European football. Tutte e due uguali. Medeci sono bilanciate, sono guarda. Come mai Milan, la città di Milano, che cinque mesi fa aveva due squadre? È il ciclo che si cambia, il ciclo già. Per cui è finito per Milan? Is it just early season blues or has the bubble burst in Milan? Well, we start at Apeano Gentile, the home of Inter, a team fancied, of course, as a title challenger this summer, but currently lying 11th in Serie A, just three points off the relegation zone. They've already been knocked out of the UEFA Cup and had that historically bad performance on Sunday against Bari. Their owner, Ernesto Pellegrini, has so far blown £40 million on the team in the last few years, but still Inter look beset by the same old problems. Lack of unity, lack of spirit and disastrous inconsistency. It's difficult. It's difficult to find the problems, especially for this defeat, because the other that we had had during the year, we had fought to the end. This seems to be the Inter of the last year. To find the problems is very difficult, because many players gave the fault to the players of the last year, but they went away. Quindi è difficile trovare delle colpe, delle cause. Sicuramente il nostro mister riuscirà a risolvere. Ma io vedo sicuramente c'è molto più c'è molta pressione. Quando ero alla Sandoria c'era era molto più tranquillo, era molto più soft. E, e diventava diventava bello anche le diventavano belle anche le cose brutte, no? Invece qua c'è molto più sotto pressione e la minima cosa si accende una polemica. At the heart of Inter's problems is, of course, Dennis Bergkamp. Inter bought him in the summer of 93, along with his teammate Vimyonk, for the sum of £17 million. Money well spent, they thought, at the time, since his arrival would undoubtedly take them straight to the top of Serie A and knock rivals Milan for six into the process. However, as we now know, none of that has happened. Just eight goals for Bergkamp in his first season at Inter, five of which came from penalties, and although he added another eight in the UEFA Cup, it wasn't the sort of figures that the fans or the critics were expecting. A year on, things seemed little better, just one goal so far in Serie A, and the press now on Bergkamp's back full-time, dwelling on his poor relationship with the team and the embarrassing fact that Inter currently win more without him. La stampa italiana non ce l'ha con Bergkamp in particolare. Bergkamp un po' tutti, dalla stampa, i compagni agli allenatori, adesso anche il presidente, hanno cercato di svegliarlo. Lui invece è uno che, come dice Sosa, buongiorno, buonasera e non lega con nessuno. Probabilmente si è un po' anche cacciato in questo guaio, insomma, si è molto isolato. 
now that you've been here for a year, it's not the paradise that maybe it seems to players over, overseas? Well, I believe it's a paradise, but it's more, uh, it's more difficult. I think it's, it's very difficult to, um, to change something, to, um, to make people believe that you can play in Italy like you play in Holland. Mm. I think that's the, that's the big problem people, uh, the big mistake people make. I, I, I can't play in Italy like I played in Holland. It's, right. um, so given that Italy isn't going to change, do you think that Dennis Bergkamp can ever really have success at Inter? Um, I have a contract of three years, so um, I'm, I'm very much uh, enjoying it here and uh, I will do everything to, to, you know, to succeed here. But again, it's, it's very difficult, but I will work hard for it. Perhaps it will all come right for Inter and Bergkamp against Foggia, then again, perhaps not. In the meantime, for all the money spent, the club have just a single UEFA Cup, and with Milan as neighbours, that doesn't really measure up. Coach Bianchi so far hasn't been able to unravel either the problems that have driven his predecessors to early retirement. Small wonder, then, that faith in the team is still in short supply. Senta, allora, tra le due squadre milanesi, chi sta peggio, Milano o Inter? Una bella domanda. Ah, ora come ora penso l'Inter sicuramente perché così gli stranieri sicuramente non, non stanno rendendo come, come ci si aspettava. L'Inter sembra di andare da basso a basso senza passare per i... L'Inter fin quando c'è eh, il, 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 il Pellegrini va bene, noi facciamo dei Pellegrini, facciamo. Quando il Pellegrini va via allora forse ci sarà qualcosa di nuovo. Perché lui che fa così male? Non, non, non se ne intende, non capisce nulla, non capisce. So bleak days at Inter, but let's face it, things aren't too much better for Milan either. As things stand, the ex-masters of the universe risk missing out on the year's three big objectives, Coppa Italia, Champions Cup and the Serie A Championship, before the season is even halfway through. Not surprisingly then, the word crisis is being heard increasingly, even here at Milanello. Ognuno di noi, sia nella vita privata che nella vita qua a Milanello e sul campo, dare un po' di più. Quello che ci manca è proprio che ci... Quello che ci nostro distingueva delle altre squadre tutti questi anni, proprio quella capacità di essere sempre pronti, di essere sempre concentrati, la mentalità proprio. So are Milan finally coming unstuck? Well, it hasn't helped that this man, the legendary Marco Van Basten, is still indefinitely out from the squad. Or that this man, President Silvio Berlusconi, is too busy running the country to buy the club lots of big name stars anymore. But folks at Milanello reckon there are two more fundamental reasons. The World Cup, with its extreme physical and emotional outlay for much of Milan's first team, and the fact that after winning three consecutive Scudettos and just about every other trophy possible, Milan just can't be bothered anymore. Sì, il problema di quest'anno è che nonostante eh, ci siano delle sconfitte non, non riusciamo a reagire e più che a reagire non riusciamo a trovare un gioco, non riusciamo a far gol, facciamo fatica. Speriamo che sia un problema di preparazione, perché se è un problema di testa è un guaio. Mm. Chi sta peggio a questo punto, Inter o Milan? Ma Inter sicuramente. <ride> L'Inter sicuramente perché non ha la nostra qualità. Mm e stanno lì come noi e noi quando, quando lo faremo vedere sarà un'altra cosa c'è differenza sicuramente e quando sarà questa? eh ma ho detto, stiamo, cioè, speriamo già domenica contro la Samp well the outlook here in Milan overall pretty grey both teams remain optimistic and certainly neither Milan nor Inter are out of the game just yet but they soon will be if they don't start coming up with the results. It'll be interesting then to see what the two teams can come up with tomorrow afternoon as Inter face Foggia and Milan play Sampdoria. Now they're both important games but we're going with Milan Samp as our live extravaganza. That'll be coming to you from the San Siro from the slightly earlier time of 1.15 onwards. Try and join us for that. Ruud Hullard of course against his old Samp teammates and a strong possibility we're told in the last few days that David Platt will be ready for that game. Whatever, if it's anywhere near as good as the last game we had with Milan, we should all be happy. Passed by Stroffer, Hullard! Oh. <laughs> isn't it lovely? What a wonderful game this is, isn't it, this football? takes games into a whole new world.